Oh, good evening, everyone. Oh, and welcome to our evening broadcast. So last night we talked about the bad things that come of meditation, the necessary evil, I suppose, or the results of the practice in terms of how it allows you to see the problems that create suffering. So the negative side of the practice. But of course it's not all negative. In fact, there's great benefit, great goodness involved in seeing the, the problems in this way. It allows you to to realize the benefits of the practice, which are many. So I thought I'd go over those tonight. Someone whose voice isn't working Just thought I'd send them a message I think So the first uh, way of understanding benefits Of course we're going by the Buddhist texts themselves We have what we call the uh, the five aims of the practice of Satipatthana. The Buddha gave us a list of five reasons for practicing mindfulness. Five bold claims, I suppose, that uh, which is indeed the path of mindfulness that leads to these five benefits. And so the first one is the purity, purity of mind. The benefit of seeing the negative aspects of experience is that it cleanses any sort of desire or attachment from the mind. The mind is no longer left wanting, left hungry, left discontent in its search for satisfaction and pleasure. Through wisdom, through seeing things as they are, the mind slowly begins to let go. weakens its grasp, it weakens its drive to obtain and attain and become. Specifically, the mind becomes free from greed, from anger, and from delusion, the three, so the three roots of all evil, right?
and so the key here is that we don't we don't artificially construct the freedom from defilement we're not trying to control our mind to not become angry or greedy or deluded the really important and I would say reasonably profound point uh, of this teaching is that it's not by controlling the mind or by fixing the problem that something so simple and so benign as mindfulness turns out to be the key that unlocks the door to freedom from suffering. It, it's what gets us out of the burning building of defilements. If you want something, you don't have to tell yourself no. You just have to study and learn about your desires and the object of your desire until you realize the truth, which is that that thing is not worth clinging to. So freedom is much more like boredom. Freedom from suffering is like boredom in the sense that you get fed up. You don't exactly get bored, but you get bored of suffering. You suffer again and again and suffer so much that you finally say, phew, enough of that. That's freedom. Freedom isn't from running away or avoiding or controlling or contriving. It doesn't come from tricks or artifices. Atanibindati dukhe esamago visudhya. And then one becomes, becomes, I want to say sick, but not sick, but becomes disenchanted with suffering. And can become sick of it. This is the path of purification. This is the first benefit, and that in and of itself is the major benefit of meditation, purity. So I talk again and again about goodness, right? Trying to instill in all of us the The, um, the sense of importance or the focus on the importance of of goodness over happiness the importance of wholesomeness also the, the importance of the the instigation of of positive states as opposed to just waiting for them to come to you, right? Waiting for happiness to drop in your lap, like some miracle from God, to actually cultivate the causes of happiness. And so I've I've been looking recently at. Uh, At these various, there are, I would say, counterculture, I suppose, on the internet uh, dedicated to goodness. It's counterculture because the internet, I think, exploded mainly on, on negative, the negative aspects of humanity, mostly greed, you know, instant gratification. But there are some aspects, some parts of the internet. I found one today. Uh, I've, I've subscribed to whole, to what is it? Uh, uplifting news. So news that is actually about the good things that people do. Um, but recently, I, I found uh, something called wholesome memes. And so it's a new take on memes that's just all about good things, and it's really quite uh, wonderful and endearing. So I posted one today. Uh, a fun drinking game. A fun drinking game. Take a shot of water every two hour, every hour or so, to keep yourself healthy and hydrated. 
I mean, no, 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 that's not actually wholesomeness. My my only point is, um, transforming our our minds from a focus on you know, gratification and uh, running away from our problems to keeping moral precepts like not drinking alcohol or etc. etc. To actually doing something about it. You know, practicing meditation. And so that's the major benefit. The major benefit is not happiness. It's purity. We don't worry about the happiness part. We want true purity, not a purity that is controlled or or uh, artificial. True purity is the source of true happiness. But there are lots more benefits and they come from purity. So the second one is overcoming sorrow, lamentation and despair. And included in here would be all sorts of mental illness. Meditation cures the mind of mental illnesses which end up being no more than simple obsessions over desires and aversions and delusions. And when you see with wisdom that nothing's worth clinging to, problems like depression, anxiety, worry, when you stop seeing things as me or mine, myself, all of these states are no longer relevant. They're no longer useful, no longer seen as useful or seen as... Right? Once you realize that something doesn't belong to you, why would you worry about it? The story of this man who drives the ox. He, he wakes up early in the morning and drives his ox up to the pasture, and then it gets light and he realizes it isn't his ox. And so he drives it back and forgets about it. Like the woman who picks up the wrong baby and starts to nurse it until she realizes it isn't hers and puts it back down and forgets about it. And there are stories like this, uh, similes like this in the Visuddhi Manga, describing this, uh, this release. Even schizophrenia, I talk, uh, I've talked several times about this, how it seems to me that schizophrenia, though though accompanied with incredible paranoia, I think in most cases, crippling paranoia, I think the paranoia aspect could be ameliorated, if not cured, to the extent that the person is able to deal with their hallucinations mindfully. Certainly not easy, but the potential is there. The third benefit is suffering, overcoming suffering. Mental suffering, physical suffering. Once your mind is pure, you don't suffer. Now physical suffering, of course, you, you, you can't remove it. Just because your mind is pure doesn't mean you're not going to feel physical pain. But there's no mental pain. There's no disliking of the pain. And so physical pain becomes just another sensation once you're able to see it clearly and remove that kernel of dislike that that makes it painful in the first place. And then it's only just a sensation like any other sensation. Happiness is a sensation. Pleasure is a sensation. Pain is also a sensation. Sorry, happiness is, is in the mind, but pleasure and pain are... are Socrates said something like this. If you read the Apology of Socrates, he says something about pleasure and pain. That's interesting. I mean, probably not in a, coming from the same place, but somewhat philosophical about... I think about there being very little difference. The fourth benefit is that you get on the right path. Through the practice of insight meditation, you enter into the right path. 
This is the key here is that the right path turns out not to be uh, what you do with your life, who you are, what you are, but how you are, how you live your life. You don't have to fret or worry about what you do. If you wind up living on a park bench, live on a park bench mindfully. And if you're living in a mansion, do it mindfully. If you're a doctor or a lawyer, be a doc be a mindful doctor or a mindful lawyer to the extent possible. I think it's possible. Mindful lawyers and mindful doctors. Mindful politicians. Wouldn't it be great if our politicians all just sat down and meditated? My mom was sending me Trump pictures of Donald Trump's head on a Buddhist monk's body. Not sure how I feel about that. I'm pretty sure how I should feel about that, but <laughs> not not sure. Wouldn't it be something, no? The right way, the right way, the right way, it sounds like such an arrogant thing to say, no? If anyone understands, if you understand mindfulness, it doesn't seem unreasonable at all. Anyone without mindfulness cannot ever be said to be on the right path, no matter what they do, no matter how kind they seem to be. Without mindfulness, they can't perform real kindness. And so what happens is through the meditation you develop habits. You break down bad habits and you cultivate good habits. And your mind changes. Your path changes. Not just in this life. So that's the thing about habits, especially deeply uh, spiritual habits or deeply meaningful habits like meditation habits. Uh, ones based on wisdom or ignorance is that they affect um, they change the foundation of who you are in this life and in the next asaming loke paramhicha in this life and the next and all lives to come that's the greatness of, of meditation is that karma isn't like a bank where you do all these good deeds and you can cash in later on karma changes you true karma isn't the act it's the mind state and so meditation is like karma karma to the nth degree because every moment you're creating wholesome karma you're changing who you are on, a, on an accelerated level accelerated pace instead of every time you do a good deed there's some wholesomeness involved Every moment that you say rising, or you say falling, or you say sitting, or you say pain, every time you recognize something as it is, you're changing who you are. You're cultivating whole good karma. This is how how encouraged we should be by the practice. With the understanding that we're creating good karma every moment that we're mindful. Well, the Buddha said that. The Buddha said, Chitna hang bhikkave kamang vadami. It is the mind state, O monks, that I call karma. So I quote the Buddha, don't quote me. And the final uh, benefit, of course, is the realization of freedom. Now, everything up until this one sort of talks about freedom, but nibbana, nirvana is true freedom, and it's on a different level than the rest of them it comes out of the rest once you begin to follow the right path and you've freed yourself from mental illness of all kinds major minor the mind lets go the mind begins to see clearly and more clearly until finally there's an epiphany and it really is an epiphany maybe not in the sense that we think about it there's no real intellectualizing but it's just a moment of clarity where the mind is says to itself 
not not in so many words, but it it just clicks. Sabe dhamma na langa vesaya. All dhammas are not worth clinging to, and it lets go. Poof. It's like turning off the lights. It's like unplugging your computer, pressing the power button. It all goes quiet. It all goes cold, cool. The heat is dissipated. The noise and chaos and suffering is all It's all uh, destroyed or done away with. This is the main goal of meditation. There is this goal. It's not something to be feared, not something to worry about. It's a state and you can think of it like a meal. You, you All you have to do is taste Nibbana. If you don't like the taste, you can go back and say, eh, this enlightenment thing is not for me. But it's categorically impossible to do that because anyone who tastes nibbana is it it's it's so real that it's impossible for you to see other than that nibbana paramang sukhang nibbana is the highest happiness. That's what they say. You know, that a person who sees Nibbana, it's impossible because it's changed fundamentally the nature of their mind through wisdom, not through any mystical, magical power, but through some higher form of wisdom that's involved with it, that just simply seeing true peace and the realization that all this stuff we called peace or happiness before that was not true peace, not true happiness. It's a categorical or a irrevocable wisdom that comes from attaining Nibbana or realizing Nibbana for yourself. So there you go. I mean, these these benefits should be familiar to many of you already. But hey, even I like I like talking about them for my own benefit. It's good for us to remember good things. Gives us an opportunity to meditate here together. Meditate in a sort of special sense of maybe a Western sense of the word to meditate and mull these things over. To step back from our practice and reflect on what we might be doing wrong and how to adjust our practice and to reaffirm what we're doing right and to encourage us in it. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for this evening. Thank you all for coming up. And I'm going to I'm gonna ask to leave early tonight. I, there are some things that I have to do. So no questions tonight. If you have any questions, come on back. Uh, Hopefully tomorrow. Although this this next week or so is, might be a little bit iffy. We'll have to see how things go. Anyway, lots of. See you all in the future. Good night. <laughs>